I'm up to Matthew chapter 15, please. Thank you guys. Love you all. Appreciate you guys. If I start crying when I preach, it's because there's a lot of emotions going on. Honestly, just to be very, very um, transparent before you, I have, um, I've carried this message. Not, I can't, I can't say that. I've carried this in my heart, this thought, idea, this interaction for months. I've um, thought about it. I've considered it. And I feel today, I just want to share what's been in my heart for months regarding Jesus and his encounter with a Syrophoenician woman. It is very, very powerful. And I think there's much to learn and much to glean from it. Would you turn with me in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 15 and verse 21 through verse 28. This story is also articulated in Mark chapter seven. But just last night I flipped it over to Matthew and it has some really compelling things. I want to speak today on a one-off message, a standalone message, the Word of the Lord. Say the Word of the Lord. And say, speak, Lord. Speak, Lord. You know, God's still speaking. He's speaking through men. He's speaking through women. He's still speaking through His Word. Speak, Lord. We must hear from the Lord. We must hear the Word of the Lord. In Matthew 15, we see Jesus encounter a Syrophoenician woman. She's a Greek, she's a Gentile, she's from Canaan, and she is in desperate help for her daughter is severely demon-possessed. I make no apologies, this is dramatic, real life, un- upfront and personal. There's no prettiness to this. This is real life. And it's so compelling. And I have just been absolutely puzzled with how she responds to Jesus in what could become a devastating moment with the Lord. Then Jesus went out from there and he departed to the region of Tyre of Sidon. And behold, a woman from Canaan came from that region and she cried out to him saying, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. It's beyond a headache and a fingernail, um, ingrown fingernail and a mosquito bite. Though I hate those and I have about 15 of them. This is severe. My mosquito bites aren't as severe. This is severe. And he answered her, not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, send her away, for she cries out after us. But he answered and he said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then she came and she worshipped him and she said, Lord, help. But he answered and he said to her, it's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said to him, yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said to her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be done as you desire. And her daughter was healed that very hour. I propose to you that many of us walking with Jesus will encounter situations and circumstances and scenarios as such. And our response is most important. Father, your word is holy. Your word is so great. We thank you that you are here as the living God. Jesus, the oracle of the Father, to teach us and to lead us. Holy Spirit, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to speak today on the God who tests. It's just a test. It was all just a test. I, I, I can't say that I've ever felt more led and compelled to share something in all my ministry. I, I feel I have the word of the Lord for this moment. 
I want to, in a moment, I want to compare and contrast the Syrophoenician woman and do what I've never done in 22 years, teach on two basically women. Because men and women can learn from the situation and it's not a gender message, it's just there's some things here that I feel we must understand. In just a moment, I'm going to compare and contrast the Syrophoenician woman with David's first wife, Michael, and break some things down that I think are most relevant. Two women drastically different, drastically handled things different, and got drastically different outcomes. Let's, as we progress today, though, establish some, some bedrock, very important things, some, some vital things, some valuable things, some crucial things, whatever superlative you want me to go back and keep going deeper, I just mean they're important. First and foremost, friends and family, believers, those who love the Lord Jesus Christ, hear me when I say this in life and on this journey of life and in faith, it's always more about what's happening in you than around you. It's always more important what's happening in you than around you. Why? Because God said in both the Old Testament and the New Testament that people always go astray in their hearts, inwardly. He encouraged us that we should beware, brethren, that in any of us there be an evil heart of unbelief that would depart from the living God. That we should exhort each other daily that you don't get hardened on the inside. Do you understand it's more important what's going on in you than around you because we don't depart from God externally. We first depart from God and his plan internally and what's happening in you is very, very important. The hardening and the flows and the various things you're going through. The second thing I wanna bring to your attention that we don't talk much about in church, or in our setting, I take responsibility for this house, but as faith people, spirit-filled people, people who love God in this hour, is how important, how much our response matters. Our response. How are you responding? Our response matters. How we respond decides and determines so much. Whether you move forward or stay stagnant to me is determined on how you respond to difficult situations. How you respond to good things, how you respond to responsibilities, how you respond to hard things, how you respond to offensive things, how you respond to transition, how you respond to areas of attack, how you respond to storms, how you respond to trials, how you respond to blessing, how you respond to favor, how you respond to open doors, how you respond when things don't go the way you want them to go. How you respond is massive. In fact, if I could go a little bit deeper, how you respond to nothing when nothing's happening. Because there are seasons of nothing. There are seasons that are uh, durations of nothing. And how you respond to nothing when God's up to something determines so much. Let me go a little deeper today because it's just not how we go through it, it's how we grow through it. I want to ask yourself the question, if you can take a fair assessment today, online and in the house, honestly, honestly, in your sphere of life, in your season of life, how are you growing? How are you growing? Are you growing internally healthy? How are we growing? And we must ask ourselves that question all the time. Where will this be in six months, in a year? This attitude, this internal situation. If I don't deal with this, where will this lead me to? How are we growing? What's festering? Jesus said, at night, somebody comes and plants something I didn't plant, but somebody comes like Satan and he plants things in our garden called tares, and if we don't deal with those things, they will derail God's plan for us because we have to take an assessment, how are we growing? Daniel 
Actually, the Bible says clearly that in Daniel and in Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom at a divinely prophetic time that Daniel actually, the way he responded, distinguished him in that house. The Bible says that Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because there was an excellent spirit. Was where in him? Was where? So what was in Daniel decided and determined how he would be preserved with everything going around him. He was in a wicked house, a foreign house, a manipulative house, but because Daniel had something of God in him that was healthy, it actually positioned him and preserved him in that situation. What's going, what is taking place in you is way more important than the circumstances you're in. And I believe that it didn't just distinguish Daniel, it positioned him to become all God wanted him to be because of how he walked in that season. Daniel 1.8 says that Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the delicacies of the king. The enemy has delicacies all around you. Delicacies of offense and delicacies of bitterness and delicacies of jealousy. And the enemy is feeding you all the time. Let me encourage you. Do not become defiled with the delicacies of the things of this world. You stay pure and you stay. I'm getting way ahead of myself, but I want to encourage you. You purpose in your heart not to become defiled and you'll become all God wants you to be. Have I told you yet, your response matters. And you don't want to say one more time, what I'm going to say that I feel, your response after this message is more important than how you hear the message. Your response. All of us in this room are going through so much. I mean, you just saw Em and I. Release our precious 18-year-old daughters for 10 weeks. And to you, and I know most people were crying in here, and, but, but we're all going through stuff. Not, not just stuff, but a plethora and a multiplicity of things. It was just yesterday that we were dropping off our 20-year-old son for Bible school in Irvine. Are we in transition? No, this is called controlled chaos in our home. Everybody in here is going through some kind of a plethora and a multiplicity of things. Why? Because this temporary life is lived in transition. There is a continual change happening around and about us. Have you realized it? Everything about it is in transition. Change is constant, change is essential, change is continual. Everything is changing but God. The only one who's not changing is God because in Malachi he says, I will change not. But everything else is changing and right now we're living in an hour where it's changing at rapid fire. Time is so sped up, there's such an intensity, we can't even keep up because things are changing so rapidly. Would the church respond with an amen? Amen. Thankfully, God does not change. So the one stability is that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he brings the stability while our worlds are changing. He maintains that. And on this great adventure of faith and life, Jesus, uh, almost now the more I read it, it's almost I can put a comical or an emoji of ha-ha next to it or an LOL, whatever, I'm a ha-ha guy, some people are LOL people, whatever, it's kind of comical because he goes, in this life, in this world, fill in the blank, you'll have a lot of it, fill in the blank, it's just, there's a lot, (laughs) fill in the blank. I've spoken to you, I've warned it to you. It's been said regarding how we carry and process things, that worry and the weight of it was described and defined this way. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrows, it empties today of its joys and strengths. So Jesus said sufficient for today is his trouble. So many, so many things out of our control. I need you to look up here to help me today. I know you think you have a lot of control, but let me just help you and tell you, you really don't have much control. So most things in our life are entirely out of control. That's why we're to trust in the Lord with all of our heart and lean not on our own control. 
And, and within our life, I mean, let's be honest. And, th- th- and I'm, I'm not applaud- If this is just too real and too upfront, we, you came on the right day to have a real authentic hurricane type of a message. There, there, are, there are so many things, let's face it, that just seem right. They're fair and favorable and they work to our advantage. Don't you love those things? Favor. I mean, favor ain't fair. And that parking spot and just so many things that just seem, oh my gosh, that was just, right? It's just, it's just right. It's favorable. It's the right outcome. And it, it, just, it just feels good. And it's right. And we love those things. Isn't that right? I mean, there's so many things in life. But then in the same breath, there's so many things that seem wrong, unjust, unfair, and work against us. And then there's so many things to genuinely celebrate. I mean, like genuinely celebrate. And then there's things we could genuinely despise. And then there's so many things to process, and how do we process all what's going on? And then there's so many things in this hour to overcome. I mean, it just seems like we just keep overcoming, overcoming, overcoming. It's like the waves just keep hitting. Would you overcome? Overcome, overcome. Jesus warned every church that we are those who overcome. And so now it's just like we got to keep processing, but I got to keep overcoming. And then I got to now make decisions. I got decisions I got to make. And you got to make it. What, what do we do? We got deci- So we got to overcome, we got to process, and we got to make decisions like now. You still, should we go forward? But, but there's a lot going on. And then not only that, but then we got a lot of variables and moving parts that we have to adapt to and live with it differently. And if you like routine, like I like routine, and if you like things in order like me, then you're really uncomfortable because it's not how it once was, and so you have to get used to the new dance, but you don't know how to dance that way because it's, it's, I, I, it's different. We're older now, and it's every nest now. What, and then we can all say, it's just so different now. Oh, it's just so different now. I could get an email from everybody that turns a pastor. It's just so different. And I say, I know, it's so different. Right? <laughs> And then there's so many things to steward. You, you've been given responsibility. You've got to steward it. And you've got to steward it through all different seasons. Some seasons you love it, and some seasons you don't. And some seasons it's growing, and some seasons it's not. But you've got to steward what it's given you. And some seasons it seems like it's dying, and some seasons it seems like it's growing. But how do you keep stewarding it? Because you've got to steward it in the season, because to everything there's a season of change. So. I'm basically giving the testimony of the Syrophoenician woman. And then in life, there's so many things to receive. And so many things to give. Because freely you receive, and freely you. And sometimes Jesus said, you've had that, now I need you to give that. But you're like, no, this was it. And he goes, yeah, you freely you receive. So like you raise your kids to give them back to the Lord. You build something for the stewardship of what it becomes. And then there's just like hurtful things. Just hurtful and challenging and disappointing things and things that just take a long time to get over. We can be honest. Like there's some category five things. Big things that happen in our world are like category fives and we've been through major storms and like Paul, we got shipwreck. Thank you, bless you. So glad you're here, mom, fighting through that baby. Bless her, Lord. Sit out there and enjoy that message. Get a free coffee on us, I mean that. And then there's so many incredible things. Oh my gosh, like God is so amazing. He does signs and wonders and miracles and he works in our life. And we're just like, oh my gosh, wow. Amidst all that, I want to just say too (laughs) that it's absolutely God's nature to test us and put us through various tests. So in that, there's tests. Tests. Psalm 17.3 says, you have tested my heart. You visited me in the night. Do you know that most God tests come when you're not even aware of it? The psalmist was sleeping. He wasn't aware of the test, but it was actually a test when he wasn't aware of it because God tests. God is the God who tests. And Psalm 66.10 says, oh God, you have tested us. It's a test. It was just a test. 1 Peter 1.7 says, he tests your faith that it become genuine. Your faith gets tested. There's the humility test, there's the obedience test, there's the faithfulness test, there's the faith test, there's the purity test, there's the waiting 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 test, there's the offense test, there's the bitterness test, there's the... 
There's the money test, there's the mammon test, there's the money test, because there's the money test, there's the temptation test, there's the devil test, there's the sin test, there's the repentance. God tests. And what I've realized is that within every test, the enemy comes with a temptation, an option, a plan B. Abraham didn't have to sacrifice his son, that was God's plan, he could have taken the temptation and not done it. Within every God test, the enemy comes with a temptation. And James 1 is so clear to say, do not say that God tempts anybody. God does not tempt you with evil. God is good and every good thing comes from him. The enemy tempts you and he lures you away from your own inward evil desires and entices you to sin because it's more about what's going on in you than around you. And while you're being tested by God, the enemy seeing is there a crack and anything I could pull because I want to entice you out of the test of God for promotion into the temptation of the enemy to keep you in bondage or keep you you stuck in where you are. Job got tested, Job 23.10. He knows the way I take it when he tested me, Job said. God tested Moses and the entire church of Israel. Moses said to the people, don't fear, God has come to test us. The Lord tested Abraham Genesis 22, you know the story. Now it came to pass when God tested Abraham, and he said to him, Abraham, and Abraham says, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love. I hope I put that in context in my opening monologue. (laughs) Could you imagine all Moses and Sarah going through in that moment? Oh, happy day. Many tell us that, 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 that Isaac at this stage was 13, 11 to 13 and could have physically harmed Abraham. That's the, that's, the, that's the realm of this thing. Take now your son, whom you love, go to Moriah, offer him, there's a burnt offering, and, and then I'll tell you what to do. And Abraham just rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and just did it. The father tested Jesus. Luke chapter 4, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, full of the anointing of God, returned from the Jordan after just being baptized, and for 40 days was led by the Holy Spirit to be tested, strengthened by the Father, and tempted by the devil. Don't you think God may be testing you too? For time's sake, I could go on and on and on, but you get the point. I wanted to biblically support God tests. Now in Hebrews chapter three, verse seven, it's very important that we understand this because it says today, if you'll hear what the Holy Spirit says, and then he says, not harden your heart, as I, when I tested you in the wilderness, so watch this, the children of Israel, because of their testing in the wilderness, became hardened. Most people, not most people, some people, when you're tested, internally you get hardened that's the potential, if you're not taught properly and have revelation, the children of Israel in the wilderness for 40 years were tested by God, but within that became hardened in their hearts. How you respond to testing determines so much. There's no doubt, there's no doubt, and I stand by this. I am not a theologian. I am a local pastor who loves God's word, endeavors to be honorable to it, study to show myself approved. You can ask my wife. This is, this is what I do. I'm called to preach the word of God, but I will stand with both feet planted and my right hand lifted up to Lord Jesus Christ and say, there's no doubt Jesus was testing the Syrophoenician woman. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. He healed the daughter. But how they got there was quite interesting. God will do what he said to you, but how you'll get there will be quite interesting. Let's just, let's just footnote it for a moment. She's from Canaan, Syrophoenician, origin of Syria. She's an outsider. She must know about Jesus, and she has a severe daughter who's demon-possessed, and she comes to Jesus, not just passively, not just quietly, not just kumbaya. She comes to him, and the Bible says she's crying out. Have you heard, of, I mean, I remember when Abby was giving birth to our children. That wasn't, there's, a, there's a something that comes from a mother, right? There's a cry. She's coming, and she says to Jesus, I don't have a mosquito bite. I don't, my my bill isn't two days late. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. Please help. 
now. This is Jesus, the Son of God, and let me tell you this, he's sinless. So how he handles her and how he handles you is right, whether you like it or not. And Jesus doesn't answer her a word. You, you got to get this, church. This is not, this is truth. He doesn't even, res- he's the son of God, carrying the heart of the father, full of mercy and compassion, grace and truth, and he doesn't even respond. Now, you and I know, 99.9% of us would have probably went something ugly. And I just want to propose this hypothetically. What if she got offended? She, don't you think this Syrophoenician woman could have began to feel all kinds of emotions? Who do you, who? If she would have got offended right here, to me, she would have forfeited everything God had for her and her family because Jesus didn't say, what do you do in seasons where God doesn't say anything? You get nothing. Test. When it's quiet, let me help you as your pastor and give you years of wisdom. When it's most quiet, he's testing. When you don't know when end is up, he's testing the character. He's testing the integrity. He's testing the motive. When you don't know what to do, he's testing. Will you do what I've told you to do? The story doesn't end there because that would have probably eliminated most of us because you know how God does it. Gideon's got 32,000. God doesn't like 32,000. Every pastor wants 32,000, but God doesn't like 32,000 because God doesn't get glory with 32,000. So God says, let's test them all. And you would think he would test them by their credit score and their giving. He did it. He just wanted to test them. said, who's fearful? If you're fearful, peace out. Go. Don't got room for you. 22 bounds. Peace gone. Boom. What do you do when you teach a pastor how to pastor a church and most of the church just leaves? And then God says, I don't like that. It's just too many. I want to get it down to a remnant. I like working with 300 because I like taking 300 against 1,000. I just feel it's better to our advantage. So I want to see how they drink water. What do you mean drink water? Yeah, because the way they drink the water will determine if they're a warrior or not. You say, what does it have to do with how I drink everything? Because what's happening in you is more important than what's happening around you. And if God wants to really use you, he'll get more microscopic to see what's in your heart. Are you complaining? Are you bitter? What's happening? So God gets it down to 300. So now, the Bible says that not only did Jesus not answer a word, then his posse, and he did have his team, pretty mobster, honestly, and then the team comes in and says, leave, we need you to leave, we need you to go. He's busy. So it went from Jesus not responding, now she's not even talking to Jesus. She's trying to talk to the boys, and they're telling her to go. And you would think that would certainly be enough, because what a bad day. She is severely in need. Jesus, the Son of God, who's sinless, doesn't say a word, and now his team is saying, ma'am, we need you to go. Your car's ready. But to our shock and awe, this outsider, Syrophoenician woman, took one more step and says, I'm going to do what I only know to do. And she bows down and begins to worship and humble herself. And she goes low when everything inside of her wants to go high in pride. She actually worships. Who's left standing? None of us. And then you would have thought that would have been the nail, but it wasn't because then Jesus then talks to her. But what he says is so like, (gasps) it's not good to take the children's bread. Give it and throw it to the... Now, I don't care how spiritual you are and how Greek and Hebrew you want to study that out. That's offensive. I'll tell you why. He's noting you're not of the tribe of Israel. You're an outsider. And where she's from in Syria, dogs were, they didn't take care of dogs like we do. You know, you love your dog. I mean, how many stickers of people with their dogs? I mean, how far have we gone with dogs? And, is this crazy? In, in Syria, dogs are everywhere. They don't have a home. They're not fed. They're like wild. 
What he's saying to her is where you come from, you know how we take care of dogs. No one takes care of dogs. But this woman, (laughs) you want her in your world. You want her in your ear, not the other ear. And she says, yes, Lord. I mean, just so respectful, so honorable. Just so, 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 yes, Lord. Hey, even the little dogs eat the crumbs which fall from the master's table. And I'd rather just have a crumb from you than at all. I don't care how you choose. You're the sovereign Lord God. I, 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 it doesn't matter, Lord. You're so great. And you're so powerful from on the front row or the back row. If I'm seen, if I'm not, it does not matter. If I just, I'll take when you decide. I don't care. I'm not in charge. I'll just take, I'll just take a crumb. Because one crumb from your table is greater than anything this world has to offer. And I don't know about you, but I've been, I'm like, whoa. Because pastors need to consider this. Worship leaders need to consider. How many marriages need to consider this? And then Jesus, like, he just like completely astonished and he's like in other translations and I haven't seen greater faith like this is just phenomenal this moment everything will be done to you and and at face value like that is so unfavorable and let me just say it she's rejected and so have you been and so many people are following Jesus with the spirit of rejection that's keeping them away from the fullness of God's plan And let me just say this, this was highly offensive. I mean, if a pastor doesn't acknowledge, remember your name for a week, we bounce. We are so high maintenance. If we, I mean, we are, if, if, if it's too loud, if it's too hot, if it's too, if, 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 if it's like any, like, we are so thin-lined and offendable. I just wonder, and I'm talking today, this is so, how many of us are in situations with Jesus where he's testing us and we're not doing it the right way because we're not reading it right? And we got all these emotions and all these things that come up. And this Syrophoenician woman to me is like David who? The Syrophoenician woman. I marvel at it. And, and I guess the, the big point, um, and that clock is working way too fast, and it's raining outside, and I'm going to be cozy. I was like planning to just hang in here today a little bit, so that was my objective. Like I really said, I'm not having no rush. And if we go into second service, let's just have them come in and join and see if they get offended. <laughs> let's offend them. Let's just offend second service and see who's spiritual. Let's just just flip it around and see who can hang today. No guile in her. Nothing came out. I don't know how the daughter got the demon, but it wasn't in her. Test and time reveal so much. Time ripens everything and test reveal it all. Because we all assume I'm good to go. (laughs) There's Jesus and Matthew or you name it. You just know. Until tests come. Until a storm comes. You don't know if you need a sandbag or not until a storm comes. You don't know if you've got a good foundation until something comes. So she's so, and I think this is a word, Google confirmed it being a word, but give me some grace. So unoffendable. Unoffendable is an adjective, which I want to have it become your objective. Unoffendable is an adjective in our grammar, and I want you to be, make it become your objective. She literally was without offense. Any way you poked at her, the, the disciples, no word, no response. And we all know how we do with no response. 
And then what Jesus says to her, she was offense proof. Psalms 119, 165 says, great peace have those who love your law, and when they love your word, nothing causes them to become She presented these most beautiful, godly qualities. I mean, I see surrender. I see she was assured. She was relaxed. She didn't knee jerk. She didn't raise her voice. She was submitted. She properly waited her turn. She waited on the Lord. She was honorable. Yes, Lord. She was sincere. She trusted and she was anchored in security and she was patient and perseverance and faithful. The balance of it all. She didn't back off. She was patient and persevering. Again, what if we had a hypothetical this morning? What if she got offended? How would that story end? I I don't think the same way it did end. Why? Because sometimes our responses matter tremendously while walking with Jesus. Offense, being offended, is so destructive to our lives and disrupts God's plan entirely. Blessing blocker, favor blocker. Every time you're offended, just go ahead and know you've damned up God's plan. Blocker, 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 blocker. Blocker, blocker, blocker. Because if your eye's good, everything inside's good. But if your eyes are bad, everything is blocking. This John Bevere was so incredibly used by the Lord in 1994 to write the book that discipled the body of Christ called The Bait of Satan. He would articulate that the one bait of Satan is offense and it will defile you. We need to learn to live free from the deadly trap of Satan, which is offense. Jesus said in Luke 17, 1 to his disciples, it is absolutely impossible that no offenses should come to you, but woe to them who they come. It is better for them that a hum- So it is absolutely impossible that offenses will not come to you, but what we do with them. The Greek word offense is, is where we get the word scandal on. It's where we get the English word scandal. And what it simply means is a stumbling block, an obstacle, something that causes sin or defilement. Jesus' relative, his cousin John the Baptist, six months probably different, John the Baptist was used to articulate Jesus' ministry, identify Jesus as the lamb slain, behold the lamb of God, baptizes him, stands up for righteousness and has an issue with Herod and what Herod is doing sexually. And because John stands up, he's thrown in prison. John the Baptist, who identified Jesus, articulated Jesus, is in prison, and he's now questioning Jesus, because it's more about what's happening in you than around you. And John finds himself in a very difficult situation, so John is questioning Jesus. John sends his disciples to Jesus, ask him, is he the one, or should we look for another? How does John the Baptist go from knowing Jesus to questioning Jesus? Because when circumstances change, you get hard. Sometimes we all fall into place to question God in tough times. John the Baptist, Jesus is the greatest and the most humble man, but he's in, he's in prison and he's sending his disciples to ask Jesus, is there somebody else? And you know what Jesus says? Don't ever forget this. Matthew chapter 11, verse 6. This, this may not make you run, but this will save and preserve your life. Jesus said, blessed is the man who's not offended for the word's sake. Because wow. sometimes following Jesus and obeying the word could become offensive. Yeah. You, you miss that. Sometimes following Jesus, you lose friends. And sometimes doing what God calls you to do, you can get ridiculed and persecuted for it. And sometimes following Jesus can become very offensive if you're not careful. Now, I know, hold on, I know sometimes we think God is a genie. But he let John be in prison. And Peter beheaded and and. Paul in prison, there are seasons you go through that are not always favorable, yet you still have his favor. Ask Joseph. How you respond determines so much. If you make it about you, you will struggle on this journey. 
But if you make it about him and a greater glory, you will do very well for yourself because the Syrophoenician woman had to remember, it's not about her, it's about her daughter. And you have to know on this journey, it's not about you or about me. You can't take it personal. Why would there be only one clap with that statement that jumped out of my spirit by the Holy Spirit and one person claps? As long as you keep making it about you, you will be stuck and you will block what Jesus wants to do in your world. Blessed is the word to mean position oneself with favor. So when Jesus said blessed, it means to position yourself with favor. And offended there means to fall away or go away from the faith. So Jesus is saying, blessed are, you, are those who don't get offended for the word's sake. That word offense there means that's how you fall away from, you fall away there. So I would put everything on it that people who fall away from the Lord first are with an offense. They were offended. They got offended. Because you don't fall away without an offense, a scandal on. And the enemy's working scandal on all of us to get us to fall away. Offenses that build up in us that take time, that we don't deal with, that we're unaware of, that build up over time, turn into what the Bible calls roots of bitterness. Those roots are what spring up, the Bible says, and cause us to become defiled and fall from the grace of God. Hebrews 12, 15, look carefully, lest any of you fall short of the grace of God, that a root of bitterness comes up and causes trouble, and by it many are defiled. It didn't start as a root, it started as a seed. But the enemy knows how to, how to feed seeds just like God does, so it's a seed in you, it gets in you, just in you. And then the enemy, just, you just keep sowing it and looking through it, and then that thing grows, and it grows, and it grows, and all of a sudden it sprouts out, and something changed overnight. It wasn't overnight, it's just that you let that offense just grow. You didn't deal with it, you didn't allow the Lord to deal with it, and the Word to deal with it. You didn't handle the test right. Because in the test of forgiveness, the enemy sowed bitterness, and you went to the temptation, and now you're defiled, and everything around you is defiled because there's a root that's not healthy. And as long as there's a root, the enemy has something to pull on. So you can even hear this message, and he's trying to pull on the root. What does he know? Who is he? Or whatever. The other woman is Michael. The first wife of King David, the daughter of King Saul. When David fought Goliath, there was given a bounty and a ransom. He had four gifts, tax exempt. Praise God. We're all in on that battle. You pay your taxes? I just wanted you to get really quiet today. (laughs) But one of the bounties and rewards was to get Saul's daughter. David does it, takes down Goliath, and so what's the next thing to get? His daughter. Saul is so wicked, he's so evil, he's so tormented that Saul didn't do it like it was right, gave him the wrong daughter, mix mix it around, and then makes David do something which is one of the most hysterical things in the Bible. David had to get the foreskins of a hundred Philistines to get the daughter he was almost promised. So we see early on a lot of chaos going on. That the Bible is so clear, though, in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 20, and 1 Samuel chapter 18, verse 28, that Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David. It says it in two places, that Michael loved David. And when you look at that word love, it was like, it, it meant that she called him beloved and dearly, like, called him love, lover, lovers, loving. She showed love. She just was infatuated with David. Michael loved David. They had that young love, that fresh love. They were engaged with it. And then, and then we find out that along the way, after 1 Samuel, the 2 Samuel, that somehow they got separated. And we don't know what happened, but they got separated. And David said in 2 Samuel 3.14, hey, I want my wife back. So they took her from somebody else and came. I don't know all the details, but now we're seeing a lot of circumstances took place within this situation and season where things could have crept in. And in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 13 is where I want to pick up. And it's a powerful story, and it says, And so it was when, when bearing the ark of the Lord that David had gone six paces and sacrificed oxen and fatted sheep, that David danced before the Lord with all of his might. And David was wearing a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel bought up the ark with a shout and with the sound of a trumpet. Do you see the moment? He's 
fought the Philistines, bringing back the Ark of the Covenant. David's leading like a leader should, and it's sounding alarm. And then the Bible, right in the midst of that, says, So the Ark of the Lord came to the city of David, but Michael, Saul's daughter, looked through the window, saw David leaping and whirling, and she despised him in her heart. Wow, two different situations. Are we the Syrophoenician people or are we the Michael people? David didn't do anything, just bring it back God's presence, but something was in her heart. And she eyed him and despised him. I think it's safe to say Michael had a root in her. Now, I could say that probably, uh, probably David did that other wives and, and probably wasn't perfect and probably there were situations and I know that they were separated so she had a lot of time to process but she didn't grow healthy. She grew, because we know that she loved him so we know she was tender and all in but something got into Michael that now she's looking and just like, how do you look at people, situations? Do you look like what you've been through? And the Bible says that she looked and despised him in in bitterness, and she looked upon him and she became bitter. It means cunning and make a plan for evil. She strategized evil. How can I tear him down? She made a plan to dishonor him. Now, we got to back up. Are you enjoying this today? Is this okay today? Is this helping anyone today? Now, now we got to back up because when I was studying this out, I go... Michael didn't eye David. Saul first eyed David. It ran her blood. So here it is. Saul's the king. And when David kills Goliath, they're singing a song. You really know where you're at when celebration comes because celebration really reveals where you are. When somebody else gets blessed, that really shows you what's happening on the inside. So they sing a song in Israel. Saul's killed his thousands. David, his ten thousands. And the Bible says when Saul heard that, he began to despise and want to kill David from that moment. So I think Michael grew up in a house of bitterness and offense. And she grew up in an environment of control and critique. So I think Michael, unlike the Syrophoenician woman who grew up in a, maybe a humble home and a be thankful home, and she became bitter. And moments later, just like Saul's trying to kill David, now Michael is wanting to hurt and hinder God's man. How many women are bitter at their spouses? How many men are bitter at their wives? Sarah could have become bitter at Abraham when he lied about her, but when she called him Lord, she got pregnant. You better be careful how you respond because the way you respond to me determines whether you stay open or barren because of how you respond. Do you know that when Sarah called Abraham Lord is when she got the miracle and she had every opportunity to be be difficult at Abraham because he lied about her. But she had enough faith in God to know. Saul lied, David. So the story goes on. And I'm going to teach this. This is going to be two parts because I'm going to get to the next part next week. Because that's why I struggled all week with this. Because God knew we wouldn't get very far. (laughs) I love the Lord. I love the Lord, Ryan. I love the Lord, Jason Lukachi, and I can't tell you enough, I can't tell you enough how you respond, how you respond, how you respond, how you respond means everything. If I looked over our lives, I could say there was moments right there where we could have just forded the baby. Just right there, giving it up. Hurt, pain, disappointment, sin. But how you respond, can I just tell you, it's a test. It's a God test. He's testing. Why? I got to say this now. Are you by the Spirit, Paloma? Are you being led by the Holy Spirit, Paloma? Paloma, the Holy Spirit's going to tell you where we're going. It's It's a comment. It's a phrase. Abby's worried for you, but I got faith in you. 
It's the pain statement. Hear this. Don't miss this. This is very, very important. The Holy Spirit told me this yesterday. Read it with me. Don't get stuck in your pain and become its victim. Your pain carries with it great purpose and promise. Don't get stuck in your pain and become its victim. You identify with what you, no, don't get stuck in your pain. Don't get stuck in your pain. Don't make a familiar spirit out of your pain. No, 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 God has purpose for your pain. There's a promise to your pain and there's nothing you've gone through in Jesus that he won't use for a greater glory and a greater grace. There's nothing God will walk you through that he will not place upon you something greater. Do not get stuck. How many people are just stuck? Frozen. You're frozen. So they brought the ark of the Lord and they set it in the place in the midst of the temple. And David had no idea what was in his wife's heart. Or vice versa. David's unbeknownst to him. He's coming home. He's waiting for like bacon and eggs. You know, like it's... I'm coming home, baby. I've been out. I'm coming home. Then David offers to the Lord, and and David and and David finishes the offering, and he blessed the people in the name of the Lord. Then, Then he distributed among the people all the whole multitude, and the women and the men, and everyone had a loaf of bread. And then David returns to bless his house. He's coming home to bless. He's coming home to bring Jesus to his home. Not, not to be blocked, but he wants to do something to his home and God wants to do something in your home. But when he comes home, Michael responds the wrong way. And when he comes home, Michael says to him, how glorious was the king today uncovering himself in, in all the maids and the servants as one base fellow shameless over covers himself. So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me instead of your father. Now we're fighting. This is a full-blown fight. This is evil for evil, and he just cut her to the heart. He, he's coming to his home as the carrying the presence of God. And she meets him, and she just basically, offensively derails him. And David says it was before the Lord. You're missing the whole thing. You're missing the whole moment. You're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. Don't miss the moment, church. Don't miss it. It was their fault. I'll be more undignified. I'll never stop doing this. God's called me. You're not going to hold me back. I'm so sorry. There's something in your heart. And the Bible says, if we compare the Syrophoenician woman who got her daughter severely healed, therefore the Bible says she had no children again. When I studied that out, Is that the Lord or not? Some commentaries said David was so turned off he no longer had intimacy with her. He was over it. Because you know, listen, male and female, we can actually turn people off. We can close the door. Some said David was done with her after that. I think to me it's bigger than that. I think this lesson here is if you don't respond healthy and right, We can actually close off what God wants to do in our homes and in our lives because of roots of bitterness and evil schemes that don't change. I told you it's more about what's happening in you than around you. And I want to encourage you like the Syrophoenician woman who did not get offended, who responded properly, stayed in the spirit, by the spirit, didn't engage in that, allowed for Jesus to touch her home, and Michael's home became barren. Do men have a lot to do with this? Yeah. Do women have a lot to do with this? Is this for marriages? No. Today's for preachers, pastors, marriages, everybody at the sound of God's voice. How, single people and married people. How do you respond? Maybe I'll end today here. Jesus has set us free. It's your job to stay free. You're already set free. 
The truth sets you free. The, you, are, you are as set free. It's finished. If there was anything he left out, he'd go back to It's done. It's over. The biggest challenge is to stay free. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. It is for freedom. You are free from head to toe. You're free from sin. You're free from guilt. He has cleansed you. But you have the responsibility to stay free. I, Matthew Pollock, am free. I'm free indeed. But let me tell you, if I eat the death, I got to learn to stay. You are free in Jesus by the blood of Jesus, by the cross of Calvary. You are free. You are healed. You are made whole. But, but, Galatians 5.1, you stand fast and fight for your freedom. Don't go back. Don't allow those things to grip your heart and grip your life. I don't know if I did it justice or not, but that has just been in my heart for the longest time. And when the test is over, whether you pass or fail, God determines, and he'll wait for another generation and start you back over again because you can't enter into the promised land with Egypt. You just can't. So he will take you the long way and say, I'm sorry, I'll take two and wait for a whole nother generation because I can't bypass my law and you can't be offended and you can't be bitter. That's against the word of God. So I will wait, I'll wait and I'll wait and I'll wait because I need people who allow Egypt to get out of them and allow the son of God and the purity of God to come in them because they can't enter in. Don't become a victim to your pain. Don't become a victim to what you've been through. We've all been through so much, but it's a momentary light affliction that works for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And we're here for him, and we bow before him, and we keep our help humble and honorable, and let it be done unto me according to your will. And one more thing I want to say, and maybe this message is done. Remember this, church. It's not your will be done, it's his will be done. And a lot of people keep praying, my will be done. But what if his will isn't your will? It wasn't Jesus' will. He didn't want to go to the cross. And a lot of things God will walk you through won't be what you want, but it's the best. We've got to learn, not my will, but your will be done. I don't belong to you. I belong to him. And whatever God wants to do with me, it's not, come on, church, it's not mom or dad. It's not my will. It's your will be done in Talon Pollock. Your will be done in Kayla Pollock. Your will be done in Hope Pollock. Your will be done in Brooke Pollock. Your will be done in Abby. It's not Matthew's will. It's God's will. Thy will be done. His kingdom come. And however he wants to heal your, whatever, however he wants to move, you trust him. He will do what he said. If you respond well, and I can't assure you anymore, do not become like Michael. Stay like the Syrophoenician. Because that boss may be your best blessing. And that rejection may be your biggest point to get healed. Because if you can get through it, mom or dad, grandma or grandpa or teenager, things are about to get even interesting in the world. They're about to get even harder and difficult. We better be spiritual. We better be clinging to Jesus. I'm talking to you by the Spirit now, prophetically. There is going to become even more Gideon test. He's testing his church even more. I feel it now as I'm talking now. It's, get ready, Gideons. He's testing hearts even deeper. There will be more things of fear and more things of bondage and more things if you're in or you're out. He'll, he'll keep testing because, because there's two. 
There's sheep and there's goats, guys. There's two options here, and he'll keep going, going, because he will get his glory, and he will refine his bride. And there is one way, and it's holiness now. And we've come so far, and we've come so deep. There's no way to turn back now. We don't, we don't. We don't block when he's coming to our home. We open our home up. Come, come, David. Bless you. Come. And some of you just need to honor your homes, and honor your marriages, and honor your spouses, and say, because we got to get this thing right. Because how many things does Jesus want to do in your home and in your family, but because of the contention, because of the animosity, because of the divide, the enemy is not able to move in homes and families because we're resisting it. It's time. Respond right. Respond well. When you study in Proverbs 6, I think I'm done. I don't know. This is fascinating to me, Talon. In Proverbs 6, it says six things God hates. Six things God hates. Six things God hates. Do you know one of them says? A proud look. He's watching your attitude of even how you. A lying tongue, one that sows deceit among the brethren, one that follows for deceit, like what God hates. In those tests, those things get tested. So, hey, can you go pick up the car? And you're thinking, well, I was going to drive the car. Why would you ask me to pick up the... He's testing. That he can promote. God test. Here it is. Thank you, Holy Spirit. God test to see who he can trust. Would you stand on your feet this morning? We're here now. Come on, lift your hands all over the room. We're here now, Holy Spirit. You want to move a God in your home and your family? Don't I, I do. Come, come, come. Don't you want to move a God in your don't we want? Touch Jesus. Come, come, come. Um, um, let me just say this to you too. God is not limited to just how he used you. Let God use people in other ways too. It's different. You know what I've had to do for Caleb and, and Hope? You know what I've had to do? I've restrained myself. I cannot tell them what God did for me my way. Because that was my 